In this lesson, we will survey some of the basic concepts in biomechanics. We will spend an entire semester covering each of these topics in depth, so please just consider this to be a basic overview. Let's take a look at an overview of the lesson. In this lesson, I'm going to try to give you some of the important concepts in biomechanics for this course. We will start with a review of some basic math, where I will introduce you to vectors and scalars. The main part of this lesson is all about force. What is it? What are the types of forces that are imposed on the body? And what are the effects of those forces? For types, we will look at internal forces that are caused by the muscle tendon complexes, or MTC, and external forces, which are the forces due to gravity, and forces that occur when the body is in contact with something. Then we will examine the effects of those forces. We will see how forces create torque. We will then see how they induce accelerations, both linear and angular accelerations. Finally, we will see how the forces change the amount of energy in the body, gravitational as well as kinetic energy. And for kinetic energy, we'll look at linear as well as angular kinetic energy. That's a lot to do, so let's get started. Before we get too far into the lesson, I want to establish the difference between vectors and scalars because we will make such heavy use of vectors. A vector is a quantity that has both magnitude and direction. Many of the concepts that we will talk about in this lesson are vector quantities. A scalar is something that has magnitude but no spatial direction. Scalar quantities include things like mass and temperature. So to reiterate, Vectors have a magnitude and a spatial direction, but scalars have a magnitude and no spatial direction. We depict vectors with arrows. The arrow points in the spatial direction of the vector, as you can see here with the arrow pointing up and to the right, or an arrow pointing down. The length of the arrow indicates the magnitude. A longer arrow means a bigger magnitude. You depict linear quantities with straight arrows. You depict angular quantities with curved arrows. Now we will get to the central concept of this lesson, force. What is a force? As Sir Isaac Newton will tell us, a force is a push or a pull by one body on another body. There are different types of forces that can be acting on the body. They can be either internal or external. Internal forces are the forces that are produced by the muscle tendon complexes. External forces include gravity and anything the body contacts with in the environment, such as the ground, another person, or an object. Let's take a look at each of these forces in a little more detail. Internally, we have the muscle tendon complexes pulling on bones. Externally, we have the force due to gravity. Due to its mass, Earth will pull things towards its center. Technically, you are also pulling the Earth towards you, but since the Earth's mass is so much larger than yours, the force that you are pulling on the Earth is negligible. We're only really concerned about the forces acting on your body anyway. Finally, we have contact forces. If you are in contact with something, you are applying a force to it. In this example, we can say that you are applying a force to the ground. Any object that you are in contact with, in this case the ground, will apply a force equal in magnitude and opposite in direction back on you. This is the ground reaction force. This is Newton's third law. Now that we understand what a force is and where forces come from, let's talk about the effects of those forces. A force can create torque. It can induce an acceleration or change in momentum. It can change energy and it can stress tissues. Let's take a look at each of these in a little more depth. First, a force will create torque. Torque is the turning effect of a force. If you've ever used a wrench or have been on a seesaw, you're already familiar with the concept of torque. Consider the wrench. We can think of that wrench as a lever or a rigid body. Whenever a force is applied some distance from the axis of rotation or pivot point, it will create the turning effect on that wrench. That turning effect is known as torque, or the moment of force 
or just moment for short. I'll be referring to it as torque for the most part during this lesson. It's important that you can figure out the direction of the torque created by a force. Start with the axis of rotation. Slide your right hand from the axis of rotation to the point of force application. Curl your fingers in the direction of that force. As you can see in this case, the direction of the force is clockwise. A force applied in the opposite direction will create a torque in the opposite direction. In this case, the torque is counterclockwise. A force that is applied through the axis of rotation will create no torque. If you pull on the wrench, or if you push on the wrench, it won't turn the bolt. The distance from the axis of rotation to the point of force application is known as the lever arm. The amount of torque is determined by the magnitude of the perpendicular force and the length of the lever arm. Moving the point of force application closer to the axis of rotation produces less torque. You already know this. If you want to increase the torque on the wrench, you move your hand further away from that handle. And if that doesn't produce enough torque, you get a longer wrench. Note that I said that only the perpendicular component of the force produces torque. Perpendicular is at a right angle or 90 degrees to the lever arm. For any angle greater or lesser than 90 degrees, that same force will produce less torque. So far, everything we've talked about is for a single force. If you have more than one force, then you have to add these forces together. In the first case, we add one linear force to another linear force. To determine the net force, we put the tip of one vector to the tail of another. Then we draw a vector from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the second. The vector in red is the net resultant or effective force. We do the same thing with torques. We take one force vector and add or subtract as necessary to determine the net resultant or effective torque. Next, we will talk about the second effect of a force. It will induce an acceleration or change momentum. To examine acceleration and momentum, we must first establish a frame of reference. It doesn't make any sense to talk about where something is without having a frame of reference. Consider asking your classmate how far away they live. The answer could be 5 miles, 10 miles, or 100 miles, depending on if they are referring to how far away they live from school, from work, or from grandma's house. Each one is a valid answer, but could also be a source of confusion. So we must first answer the question, from where? The from where part is answered by establishing an origin. The origin is where the frame of reference starts. If you were asking how far away your classmates live from school, then school would be the origin. Next, we need directions. It's only helpful if your classmates tell you they live east of school if you have a mutually agreed upon understanding of the east. For the most part, for this class, we will be referring to directions as being horizontal or vertical. We also have to have a direction for angular motion, such as clockwise or counterclockwise. We will link these to the anatomical directions you already learned about earlier in class. Now we have to consider what are referred to as kinematic variables. The first kinematic variable to consider is time. If I asked you, you would probably say you know what time is. If I then asked you to define it, you might hesitate. Personally, I like the definition that is attributed to both Buckaroo Banzai and Albert Einstein. And that is, time is the thing that prevents everything from happening at once. Now let's talk about position. Position is the location in the frame of reference. Notice the red ball's position vector is from the origin to the center of the red ball. That's the linear position. The angular equivalent is the orientation within a frame of reference. That angle, denoted by theta, can either be to an external reference, such as the horizontal, which is in this case called a segment angle, or reference to another segment, shown here in yellow, which is referred to as a joint angle. Next we have displacement, which is the change in position. Again, we can talk about a linear displacement, which is the change in position from one moment in time to another. Remember, we need time to change position because you can't be in two different positions at the same point in time. 
The angular displacement is a change in orientation from one moment in time to another. Angular displacements are important because they are the joint motions that we started discussing earlier. Velocity is how fast you are going in a particular direction or how quickly your position is changing. Let's take a look at this runner. She has a certain velocity. Now let's look at her at another instant in time. Notice that she is going faster. Her velocity increased. In order to increase velocity, we needed to have an acceleration over a period of time. Acceleration is how quickly the body is speeding up or slowing down in a particular direction. If she is speeding up, then the acceleration is in the same direction as the velocity. Now it's time for a warning. The effects that we will talk about going forward refer to the effective force or the effective torque. That is the net force or torque or the sum of all the forces or the sum of all the torques. When we have more than one force or torque, we must add them together using the rules of vector addition. In this case, we determine that in order to speed up, we have an acceleration that's in the direction of the velocity. What caused that acceleration? The effective force, or the sum of the forces, caused that acceleration. Note that the direction of the effective force is always in the direction of the acceleration. Let's return to our runner once again. In this scenario, at another moment in time, she is going slower than she was the moment before. If she's going slower, then the velocity changed. If the velocity changed, there had to be an acceleration. In this case, since she is slowing down, the acceleration has to be in the opposite direction of the velocity vector. So we see here that the acceleration vector is opposite of the direction she is going in. What caused that acceleration? Once again, we see that it was an effective force that caused the acceleration. And again, the acceleration and the effective force are always in the same direction. When the body is slowing down, that vector is opposite of the velocity vector. Remember that velocity is vector, so it has both a magnitude and a direction. In the previous cases, we talked about changing the magnitude of the velocity vector. Now let's see what happens when we change the direction. In this case, the athlete performed a cutting maneuver and changed her direction of her velocity. She went off on an angle. So now we see that her velocity changed. And once again, we see that the acceleration caused that change. The acceleration vector might look a little strange to you. But if we use the rules of vector addition, we can see that the acceleration vector is oriented that way. From this information, can you determine the direction of the force vector? There is one other scenario I'd like you to be familiar with. In this case, we are going to move a cup from its resting place to your mouth. Initially, the cup isn't moving, so its velocity is zero. When the cup reaches your mouth, the velocity had better be zero, or you're going to be in for some expensive dental work. This is a very common scenario where the starting velocity and the ending velocity is zero. Again, the effective force vector has to be in the same direction as the acceleration vector. When the cup is speeding up and the acceleration is in the direction of travel, the effective force vector is also in the direction of travel. When the cup is slowing down and the acceleration is in the opposite direction, the effective force vector is also in the opposite direction. One thing I've asked you in the prep guide and I'll have you discuss with your groups is what happens when the effective force is zero. Now let's turn our attention to angular motion. Before doing so, it would be helpful to review the symbols that I've used for linear motion and to show you what symbols I'll use for angular motion. On the left, we have all the symbols we use for linear motion. And on the right, we have all the symbols that we use for angular motion. Notice with the exception of time, that all the angular symbols are Greek letters. Let's use wheels to illustrate the concepts of angular motion. In this scenario, the wheel is moving with a certain angular velocity in the clockwise direction. At a later moment, the wheel has a larger angular velocity. 
To get a larger velocity, there has to be an angular acceleration in the direction of the velocity. Something caused the wheel to speed up. That something is an angular acceleration in the direction of the angular velocity. And that angular velocity is caused by an effective torque, which is in the direction of the angular acceleration. In this scenario, the wheel is moving with a certain angular velocity in the clockwise direction. At a later moment, the wheel has a smaller angular velocity. To get that smaller velocity, there has to be an angular acceleration in the opposite direction of the angular velocity. Something is causing that wheel to slow down. That something is an angular acceleration in the opposite direction of the angular velocity. And that angular acceleration is caused by an effective torque, which is in the direction of the angular acceleration. For this class, we'll leave it at that, and we will not talk about momentum. We'll leave that for your biomechanics class. Next, we'll talk about how force changes energy. Even though he didn't uncover the laws of thermodynamics, let's use Nikolai Tesla as our spokesperson for energy. First, we need to define energy. Energy is the state of matter that makes things change or has the potential to make things change. In this class, we will concern ourselves with two types of mechanical energy, gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. Gravitational potential energy is the energy associated with position. If something is sitting on the ground, it's not changing, nor does it have the potential to change. If we raise it up, now it has the potential to change. There's a potential there. All we have to do is release it. If we were to raise it higher, then it has a greater capacity to change. So the higher we raise something off the ground, the more potential energy it has. The second type of energy we will concern ourselves with is kinetic energy. There are two types of kinetic energy, linear kinetic energy and angular kinetic energy. Let's tackle linear kinetic energy first. Again, let's examine our runner. At a certain speed, she has a certain amount of kinetic energy. If she runs faster, she will have more kinetic energy. But if she's running at a certain speed and then she slows down, she will have less kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is tied to velocity. Greater velocity has a greater kinetic energy and a smaller velocity has a smaller kinetic energy for the same body. Conceptually, Angular kinetic energy is no different than linear kinetic energy. For this example, let's use a baseball bat. The baseball bat is moving with a certain angular velocity and thus has a certain amount of kinetic energy. At another moment in time, the bat is rotating faster. It now has a greater amount of kinetic energy. Just like linear kinetic energy, let's say the bat is rotating with a certain speed and then slows down that bat will have less kinetic energy. Again, kinetic energy is tied to velocity. Angular velocity can be a little bit trickier than this, but we will cover those situations in your biomechanics class. So we see that if something speeds up or is raised higher off the ground, its energy increases. What caused that energy to increase? A force or torque applied in the same direction did. If something slows down or is lower towards the ground, then its energy decreases. What caused the energy to decrease? A force acting in the opposite direction did. Let's revisit the examples from earlier. What raised an object up off the ground? A force acting in the vertical upward direction did. The force is in the same direction as the displacement. What lowers an object to the ground? And I should mention here that we are talking about a controlled lowering to the ground. The object isn't in free fall. That's a situation we'll discuss in a more advanced class. Controlling an object downward requires a force that's acting in the upward direction. If you were thinking that the force was going to be in the downward direction, you were thinking of the net force. Remember, forces in the direction of travel will cause something to speed up. If it is being lowered at a slower speed than what gravity would do, then there has to be a force acting on the body other than gravity. 
That force is in the opposite direction and it is absorbing energy. For linear kinetic energy, let's return to our runner. In the first scenario, she was running with a certain velocity and then she sped up. The force acting to accelerate her is the same force that increased her kinetic energy. I hope you can see that this is just another way of looking at the same phenomenon. A force that causes her to accelerate will increase her velocity, and if we increase velocity of a body, then we will increase the kinetic energy of that body. The same scenario will apply here to slowing down. The force acting to decelerate her is the same force that decreased her kinetic energy. Again, it's another way of looking at the same phenomenon. A force that causes her to decelerate will decrease her velocity, and if we decrease the velocity of a body, then we'll decrease the kinetic energy of that body. And again, we can extend this concept to angular motion. With the baseball bat, it was rotating with a certain speed, and then it sped up. The torque acting to accelerate the bat is the same torque that increased its kinetic energy. Again, this is just another way of looking at the same phenomenon. A torque that causes the bat to accelerate will increase its velocity, and if we increase the velocity of a body, then we will increase the kinetic energy of that body. And then the same scenario will apply to slowing down the bat. The torque acting to decelerate the bat is the same torque that decreased its kinetic energy. The torque that causes the bat to decelerate will decrease its velocity, and if we decrease the velocity of a body, then we'll decrease the kinetic energy of that body. The next effect that a force has is that it will stress tissue. However, we will not cover this effect in this class. We'll save it for your biomechanics classes. So we've covered a lot of ground in a very short amount of time. Let's review what we just did. In this lesson, we went over some of the important concepts in biomechanics for this course. We started with a review of some basic math where we talked about vectors and scalars. The main part of this lesson was all about force. What is it? What are the types of forces imposed on the body? And what are the effects of those forces? For the types, we looked at internal forces, which are caused by the muscle tendon complex, or MTC, and external forces, which are forces due to gravity and forces that occur when the body is in contact with something else. Then we examined the effects of those forces. We saw how forces created torque. We then saw how they induce accelerations, both linear and angular accelerations. Finally, we saw how forces change the amount of energy in a body, gravitational as well as linear and angular kinetic energy. So that was the summary of biomechanics. It's just enough to get us going for this class. A more in-depth treatment of these topics will be part of your advanced biomechanics class.